Here we go. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, Extraction of Governed Data Domains at Enterprise Scale, sponsored today by D3 Clarity. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just a note, Zoom defaults the chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To find the Q&A or the chat panels, you can click on those icons found in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speakers for today, Dave Wilkinson and Peter Coppenrath. Dave is the Chief Technology Officer at D3 Clarity. Over the past decade, Dave has been a thought leader in extracting knowledge from corporate data assets. Dave's approach to focus on desired outcomes. This focus directs the investment in tooling to maximize the outcomes value based on the available data. By applying pragmatic thinking, his Six Sigma black belt skills and, ad, and agile execution techniques, Dave's approach enables valuable insights without massive effort and investment. Dave brings a wealth of skills to knowledge generation, including data infrastructure, master data management, and data governance. Peter works in technology partner alliances at Precisely Software. For the last 25 years, he has been helping customers to move, assess, govern, correct, and enrich their data. Prior to joining Precisely in 2011, he worked at IBM, with their Infosphere uh, software line. And with that, I'll give the floor to Dave and Peter to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Good afternoon and thank you, Shannon, for that great introduction. This is Dave Wilkinson from D3 Clarity. And as uh, Shannon just said, uh, joined by Peter Coppenrath from Precisely. And we'll, we'll be talking through Extraction of governed data domains at enterprise scale. This is uh, based on a use case of a large uh, oil and gas organization. And we'll be doing a little bit of background and then diving deeply into a use case and uh, case study. So thank you very much. And thank you everybody for attending. I'm excited to be here. Um, so the agenda, as I just mentioned, we're going to be talking about uh, the importance of governed data and governed data domains, uh, walking through an overview, a little bit of master and reference data, a little bit of uh, MDM awareness. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the data you have and the concept that we all have data that is in, in, the, all this, in, in the systems. And a lot of this is the extraction of that data and the extraction of those data domains to describe the environment in which we live and the environment in which we work. And then just diving deep into the case study, uh, which I think everybody will find interesting, and then a little bit just about who we are and why we do this. So, so just before we get into the background, I want to talk a little bit about the case study that we'll, we will be discussing uh, as we get into the depths of this uh, webinar, this presentation. And the, the focus has been the complete redefinition of financial planning across uh, a large energy, uh, energy organization. Financial planning being the process of building the, the plan, the financial plan, and then dovetailing that with the actuals as you move through, through, through uh, a financial year. The focus here is the redefinition of that financial planning process because this particular organization had issues in the master data correlation between actuals and planning and getting the plans in in time, et cetera. And the idea is to was to replace and curate all the inconsistent reference and master data across this organization with managed and consistent versions of that data in Precisely Zentworks product, which is why Precisely are joining with us today. Um, and that gives us a complete view of governed data and governed domains across this structure. The original estimate for this project was 12 months, and that was just to get the master data in place, not necessarily talking about getting the planning application in place. So that was just the master data and the building out of what we're gonna talk about here today. Some stats on this project as we got through to the end of it, there were over 2000 individual plans to capture. So if you think of an organization where each department is building a financial plan for the coming year, there's over 2,000 of those organizations, essentially who is spending money. Then over 300 general ledger accounts. So these were what they were spending money on across 
five different separate instances. And by instances, I mean of the planning application. That doesn't include all the other myriad of applications that are all dependent on this same data, this master data, this reference data that describes the organization and the structure of this organization. And that led to over 200 separate master and reference data dimensions leading in to describe a particular expenditure or planned expenditure. And the, so that was the that was the goal. That's the structure of the use case and the case study when we get into that further on. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about the importance of governed data domains and looking at data domains in general. And a lot of you probably already know this since you're data diversity audiences, you're probably uh, already dealing with data governance, master data management and uh, data individuals. So I'm not gonna to dwell too long on this, but let me get, get in, into this. In today's environment, well, the way we see it is it's truly important to have accurate data that describes the environment in which you operate. Your business leaders need to have the best job, the best tools in order to do their job. And their job is, in this case, decision making and financial decision making. So it's incumbent upon us to provide the best possible tools in this case. And this, a lot of these tools are based on the data often referred to as domains. And the common domains of data that we're talking about here are things like customer product organization, but also vendor asset employee and other areas of data that start to describe the world or the business that you live in, right? We all deal with customers, we deal with products, we sell products to organizations, that organization then becomes a customer. So how do you describe this? How do you govern that data? And that's what we're really talking about here. Um, what is important in this is the consistency and quality of that data. Is it consistent across every operational system? Do all your operational systems describe the same universe, describe the same environment in which you operate? Have you got the same list of customers, the same list of product? Is customer defined the same way? And that's what we're talking about here. And preserving that, that consistency is crucially important across the environment, across the entire uh, business. If you look at two departments in the same organization, do they think customers do the same thing? Do they think the same products are being sold, et cetera? And then measure the quality of that data. This data is often uh, collected in different environments. And then how do we measure the quality of that and make sure it's trusted across uh, the organization and fit for purpose across that? And then to put a flip side on that, we've all got every one of us who's been in this industry for a while understands the cost of inconsistency in this data. We've got horror stories and anecdotes abound, and you've probably all got your own in this environment, right? From um, units of measure that are wrong, we can tell stories of organizations that have shipped the wrong products or the wrong set of products or the wrong, I've got one particular story where they sold wire by either the spool, the roll, or by the foot. And there's instances where they shipped to the wrong one. So somebody received 100 feet, 100 spools of cable instead of 100 feet of cable. And this causes increased operational costs. It causes business missteps. It causes missed opportunities, which are very hard to quantify. And it causes a lot of risk and a lot of second guessing in the decisions that we're making and in the business. And a lot of checks and balances that get expensive get put in place to correct this data and correct this structure. So the investment in this is tremendously important to save these missteps and also to expand the opportunities and really grow organizations. Just a little bit on my definitions on master and reference data. So as I've talked about, the way I look at master data really is embodies the core of these domains, especially the ones that are outside of your control and outside of your organization. The way I often look at it is a domain of master data exists whether you are in the picture or not. So an organization exists and can be identified even if they're not one of your customers. They exist in the real world. And so that makes up this set of true master data, crucial master data. Your products to a certain extent exist in the real world and can be identified, um, et cetera. Your vendors, 
other areas of domain, uh, other areas of your business. So this is the idea behind the master data. And the intent is to describe the environment in which you operate, to describe the universe in which you find yourself consistently and effectively across your entire business. And then it encapsulates the process and the work and the workflows that cause this data to be fit for purpose. So you can use it to identify a customer. Then they're, they're a customer, not just an organization. They are these different things and the data is, is fit for purpose. The way I look at reference data is often the reference data adds color to this world, right? It's the adjectives to the nouns. It describes exactly how they behave, exactly how you operate. And um, it gives a, the intent here is to give systematic organization and structure behind the data. How many of something do you sell? How do you sell it? How do you operate? Where do you operate, et cetera? So the reference data becomes that depth. Often it can be sourced either internally or outside the business, but it adds this depth to the world in which you operate to give real clarity into this trading environment and into this environment. So I'm gonna hand it to Peter now just to talk a few words about the entire process and the precisely view. Yeah, you know, so to start with, fundamentally, this is a story about a very large energy company uh, that needed to modernize their financial reporting, financial planning, but effectively couldn't do that until they got the data governance slash data integrity under control. And when people hear energy company, a lot of times they immediately start to think of an MDM solution that's specialized in some way for that. But you know, the precisely product, and, and we were chosen as the software partner here with D3, and we we're very proud of that, uh, fundamentally does not care about the data domain uh, or the part of the business that you're in. Uh, to, to us, this is all data. This is, you know, every company has master data, and this is something that we can work with. Can we move to the next slide? So as far as the, the other thing that's an important part of the story is you could tell this story and focus on the new technologies that they added in for their financial reporting, you know, uh, financial planning. But that would only be part of the story. The truth is that all sorts of initiatives rely on a foundation of having trusted data in, under, in getting your data governance and your master data under control before you move forward. Uh, like artificial intelligence, that's something everyone cares about quite a bit right now. That really works better when you know the data that you're feeding into your AI models and that you trust the data going in. Um, in, in some ways, this particular story was a cloud adoption and analytics and BI story. Again, you need to get the data under control before you can do those things effectively. The same with all sorts of modernization efforts, whether they're moving off of legacy, legacy systems or just moving towards the cloud. And then we can go forward one more slide. Now, I just started off by saying uh, we're, you know, we don't particularly care about the data, but there are lenses you know, for different industries. And there are different ways of using our tool and, and best practices that, that meld itself to different industries. So it is something there, but you start off with a tool that fundamentally deals with data and master data, and then you tailor it for whatever particular area you're using it in. And I'm set with those slides, Dave. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. That was a good background. Um, what I want to talk to you about now is the idea that you have data, right? The data exists. You Most people have been operating a business for a long period of time, usually very successfully, before they get to this point of looking at the governed data. So what we're looking at is there is a data landscape. We've often built up our data over the course of many years over different systems that were put in for, a different, for specific purposes or for different purposes. And the data has grown in those environments. They're not always connected. They're not always seamless. They're not always uh, properly together. We haven't always focused on our data and our data architecture and our data environment as a crucial part of our infrastructure, as a crucial part of our strategy. We focused on applications or personal productivity or various areas of the infrastructure, but not necessarily on the data. So what we're talking about here is that that data environment exists. 
it is live, it is moving, it is breathing, if you like. And what we're trying to do is extract that data, extract that master data, extract that data, that governed data, and place it under govern, uh, under governance, and place it under management to make sure that the processes, the standards that are embedded in the systems are now across the entire organization. And that the, the data, when it gets back into those systems or into those systems, is for, for fit for purpose and can be used for the purpose that it's want. You can actually use the data within Salesforce to sell. You can actually use the data in SAP to invoice, et cetera. Often this data has to be understood and extracted from the systems. It exists, but it exists in silos. How do we understand it? How do we look for it? How do we make this work? So we're gonna talk about now getting into towards that use, use case and that case study, extracting this data to be governed. So how do we discover it? Looking into the applications, understanding the core definitions of, the, of this data, what the data is, and profiling it to understand how good is it? What does it look like? How is it fit for this purpose? How can I use it? And then mapping it across these systems, both where it is equal. In other words, does an organization exist in two different systems, SAP and Salesforce.com or whatever systems it might be, where they're both describing an organization external to yourself, as well as modeling it to how does it interact with the product, right? How do you make that sale to that organization? How do you bring that forwards? And then building up this data map and this data model of your entire enterprise outside of the systems. And then making sure the data is fit for purpose. So getting into the cleansing environments, the enrichment to make sure as it is used, it is used for, for those uh, purposes and for those functions. So looking at data modeling for a moment and data mapping, the modeling to our definition is it involves the defining of the structure and the relationships between these elements and these entities identifying the entities, defining these entities, and defining them in a manner that is independent of the system. And then aligning that with the functions, right? Making sure that it sat satisfies the operations and we can move forwards. And then mapping these across the domains, across the domains and back into those systems so we can extract and build this forwards. We often pick, uh, draw this out as a relationship diagram, as an entity relationship diagram, as an object model, that starts to describe your full enterprise data model and starts to then describe how each entity manifests itself in a particular system for a particular purpose or function. So looking at then the purpose, making sure the data when it gets to the system, can I transact on it? Can I use it for what it's needed? Do I have to do remedial work on it? Can I fix it? How do I govern that? How do we ensure it is there? And what are the processes? And is it consistent across systems? Does it really describe what it pretends to describe or what we purport it to describe? We're now gonna delve into the case study. And as we mentioned before, uh, this is focusing on enforcing the standards, extracting the data, reverse engineering the applications, reverse engineering both the master and reference data from the applications to give us a full picture of how this financial planning can be done for this one particular business. Remembering that this is part of their core structure and also connected to other systems across their environment. So the problem as it was presented as well and how it is done today, and we're probably all familiar with this picture where there's way too many copies of Excel and Excel spreadsheets and way too much manual activity in what should be a standardized and structured, relatively structured process with consistent data. The idea here is that this organization, they would at the beginning of a year or within the year, reach out to all the organizations that had to put together a financial plan and send them a spreadsheet that's a template and ask them to fill it out with how they're gonna spend money in the next year. And these would all come back as a set of manually created spreadsheets, which were loaded into databases so that they could be correlated with each other. And of course, there's a manual step here because not everybody was using the same general ledger accounts, the same reasons to spend money, et cetera. Right, So this was loaded into a set of databases across the different business units. And remember, this is a large 
global organization that operates in like 130 countries across the world. So you can imagine the complexity of pulling this all this together. Once all this was loaded into the various databases that it was loaded into, they then created more spreadsheets with it, right? So that then it was reviewed, managed, targeted, unloaded into an enterprise data warehouse where they would then correlate further and do further roll-ups to extract further spreadsheets and presentations and other things to get the financial plan approved. All this happened in a planning silo. So this isn't necessarily connected directly to the actuals. It was correlated with the actuals as a manual task. And this information, while manual, was used to drive regulatory uh, so submissions, their 10K, 10Q, et cetera. So you can imagine how fraught with error and how painful this process was for this organization year in, year out. And it would take almost a year to get done each and every year. So the goal was to move this to a structured program, right? Put in a structured planning application that could be used across the entire organization, taking the on-premise reporting and some applications built in the cloud. They actually closed work, chose Workdays Adaptive to do, to do, this, to do this application using Enterworks to manage all those domains and structures of the data and then reporting out of it using Snowflake and using uh, the Snowflake tools. So that was the 2B architecture state to be done extremely quickly and extremely aggressively. So where do we come in as D3 Clarity? So we looked at these applications and looked at the master data and said, okay, that's a, that's a tough job. If you look at the slide on the left, the, the, the image on the left, this is the essentially what equates to a, a entity relationship diagram for the entire structure. The green uh, squares in the center, the screen, green rectangles represent the applications and indeed the business units for the organization. And then the gray squares represent all the dimensions of master and reference data that feed into that from units of measure to products to locations, organizations or departments within the structure, projects, et cetera. There's a whole set of master and reference data. So that just shows you sort of the level of complexity and the level of, of structure we were dealing with to create a master data environment. Now, remember this is a project in flight. So we started out thinking there was gonna be 90 domains as you can see, there's way more than 90 as we work through it. And these domains in, the, in and of themselves are not trivial. Some of them are quite complicated. As you can see from the diagram on the top right, the, this shows the general ledger and organizational department structure, which are a recursive hierarchy of each one of these, giving you that structure. And this should be tied to HR and to finance, et cetera. And so this gives you a picture of the overall structure that we're looking for and we were reverse engineering all this from applications that were live at the time so this was not a build it and they would come this was reverse engineered out of live applications the image at the bottom is a spreadsheet as you all know which is showing the complexity of what they're doing currently there's over 200 tabs in this spreadsheet with a with a tremendous amount of data in it and a tremendous amount, therefore, of manual activity and just work going on in managing work, working that. If there's 200 tabs, you can't search for tabs. You're scrolling through these tabs all the time, and they contain an awful lot of highly crucial and highly uh, critical information for this organization. So what, what we did was we extracted this structure from the running business applications for finance for both uh, actuals and for um, the planning and for other systems so that we could correlate this together and build the structured data flow and the structured management from this picture and from this data set. This we then pushed into Precisely's Enterworks MDM product, right? And built both the repositories, the UI, the hierarchies, the workflows, the whole set 
defining this application and giving a workable UI that could be presented to their business users, to the actual people doing the planning, so they could now manage their own master data for the organization and put the right approvals, the right structure in place. And we generated this for these 200 uh, domains of data with a workable structure with data uh, validation, data references, uh, generating keys, et cetera. The whole set of this uh, data set was generated within the uh, Enterworks product. What this gave us was the ability to work in an agile manner with the development team. So this was generated in about 30 minutes from the applications. So each time they did a turn from an agile perspective in the application or discovered that there was a new general ledger account or a new reason, new organization, a new set of reference data that was used to describe a particular organization's expenditure, et cetera, we could regenerate the master data from the live data in the organization. And then at go live for this application, we could reverse the flow and suddenly make Entworks the master of this data, the system of record, if you like. And then this data would flow consistently to now all those downstream systems to give you a structured way of managing all this data across 200 domains of data and push this out to the entire business across the world. Very valuable and it saved a tremendous amount of time and makes the data a lot more effective going forwards. So to, re, to restate, the objective here was to completely redefine the financial planning process within this organization, replace and curate all the inconsistent reference data and master data across the organization. And it was uh, quite a lot of data, as you can imagine, right? And the original estimate for this was 12 months just to do the master and reference data management portion of it, let alone the mining for how the financiers, how the planning people are actually doing that. This, as I said before, gives us over 2,000 individual plans to capture, over 300 general ledger accounts of where money is spent, five different separate instances, and over 200 separate master data uh, dimensions where we were authoring, creating, curating, and publishing this data through this cycle, building the whole flow uh, and integrating it in with those applications. A lot of work. Just to give you some, so this is what we did, right? The outcomes of this was to redefine the way that planning is, is done. And we finished uh, with 2024 planning. So that is done now. And then we're starting to look now at 2025 and how the organization is changing into 2025. We built a lot of automation. So this was automating the extraction of the metadata, as well as the data from the in-flight applications and building this out using uh, DevOps techniques with Python scripts, and then pushing it into the Enterworks application to drive this. So this was a lot of ma uh, me 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 metadata management, a lot of reverse engineering, a lot of exploration into those systems to understand how the data mapped together and pulling it from those applications so that we could then hit them on an automated, on a DevOps cycle, on a turn of a uh, sprint, if you like, during the application implementation and generate the whole master data environment. What this does, for those of you who are in master data, master data is often considered a cost and an expense that nobody really wants to pay attention to. Everybody wants master data, but nobody wants to do the management of that master data. So what this gave us the ability to do is to turn it on its head and put the focus back on the application, which is where it should be, and then generate that whole master data flow from the, from the applications, and then at go live, turn around the flow of the data. So as I've said before, we generated all the objects, all the structures in Enterworks in under 30 minutes, right? And that was the runtime for the DevOps procedure to do that. Generating over 200 repositories, generating a workable user interface. I'm not saying it's gonna be the best user interface for every one of them. 
and there is further work to tweak this to make it great for certain of the dimensions, but it was a workable user interface for all 200 plus dimensions. Over 2000 attributes, right? Over 2000 data points that were actually put under management as defined structured attributes within this. And over 10,000, way over 10,000 actual data items extracted from these applications and then the flow reversed at point of go live. This all had reference lookups, foreign keys across the repositories and where there was a more complex structure within that dimension, then uh, that was built into it as well with that structure. And then with the hierarchies of data referring others and code sets for reference and data validation where appropriate. This was all done within six weeks. So we started in December, delivered essentially in February for the planning process. So remember when I started, when I was talking about this use case, it was an estimated 12 months to go from December to December to get just this master data piece in, in place. And that was assuming you actually knew what all the dimensions were. Within that six weeks, we moved from 90 dimensions up to over 200 dimensions. So the scope of this changed as they did the discovery and did the analysis within the organization to understand what they were actually doing with all those spreadsheets and what fields were actually in those spreadsheets. So you start to see how this complexity comes together and how we drove this automation, right? As we look into 2024 now and moving through that, we're starting to drive more standardization where the planning process now can get more standardized. It's not all in spreadsheets, so they can start to optimize. With that is gonna drive changes into a lot of this master data. So there'll be another release of this and another release of all the master data as we move into, uh, move on to 2024 planning instead of 20, uh, 2025 planning instead of 2024 planning. So with that, just a little bit about who D3 Clarity is. We're a uh, bespoke, targeted data management uh, consultancy, focusing on data architecture, uh, enterprise data strategy, enterprise data strategy for machine learning and driving data into that, bringing these domains and this structure of data, not only to the operational systems, but also to analytical systems, machine learning, AI, and decision-making systems. With that comes data governance, master data management, and various other areas. Cloud migration is key and security. We've worked on about 150 plus projects uh, over 13 different industries with over 20 plus years of experience for most of our uh, consultants and most of our organization. And then we're recognized as one of 18 from an MDM perspective. Okay. Uh, back to you, Peter, for a little bit on precisely. Peter? So precisely is a- Right there, I got it. Sorry, I, had, I couldn't get off of mute. Every time I pushed the mute button, it was coming back on. Uh, no um, worries. The precisely has quietly uh, been becoming a much larger company over the last 50 plus years. Um, we were literally one of the original software companies delivering software for the mainframe right after IBM did the unbundling in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, we currently have over 12,000 customers. We have 99 of the Fortune 100. And we're, we're you know, a leading provider of data integrity and master data management. That's it for that. Oh, a uh, little bit on our data integrity suite. You know, part of now, not every piece of what we were providing was part of this project, but, you know, we fully believe that the journey to data integrity uh, and understanding and trusting your data includes all these things that we see on the bottom here. So data integration, data observability, data governance, data quality. Those are things that were particularly involved in this, uh, but also, uh, you know, adding to the data, enriching the data, geo-addressing, data enrichment, spatial analytics. Those are all part of the capabilities that we're offering uh, our customers and our software and our partners. And I want to just add to that a little bit, which is uh, Peter's absolutely right. We did not use all these pieces within this project, but we are familiar with all aspects of this project suite and I have used various pieces of them. We absolutely did use the data integ integration 
the master data management and some of the data enrichment pieces within this project. And this is a great suite of products for building this out. And we all know that you all own multiple technologies and from multiple vendors and bringing this together, all this capability makes a tremendous journey for your data and through this kind of uh, process and program to expand and bring your data under control and your data under management. So it can really be drive that consistency, reduce that cost of inconsistency and drive you into the future as a much more uh, a, a efficient and speed up decision-making, both automated decision-making as well as manual decision-making as we look to the future. Thank you for your time. If you want to reach out to us, our contact information is here. Both myself, that's Dave Wilkinson, the CTO at D3 Clarity, and Peter at uh, Precisely. Uh, thank you for listening to us. I do see there's some questions. Uh, Shannon, do you want to uh, take us forward? Yes, thank you both for this great presentation. Uh, just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording. Feel free to put any additional questions in the Q&A panel. Uh, so diving in here, um, so can you expand on the impact Fit for Purpose has on business? The impact of fit for purpose for business, it has a tremendous impact, really, which is if your data is dis determined as, let's look at it from a negative point of view. If it's not fit for purpose, how do you remediate it? How do you correct it? How do you make it fit for purpose? And what I mean by fit for purpose is, do you have enough information to send that invoice? When a deal closes, have you got the information that moves a prospect to a customer and allows you to trade with it? Do you have the right delivery information? Do you have to collect uh, further at as a reactive step, right? Do you have to find out what your delivery date is or delivery addresses are? So this is about what transaction are you about to do? And do you have all the information in the right form to be able to make those decisions and execute that transaction correctly and satisfy that purpose of that transaction. Does that answer the question? I believe so, and can definitely uh, have the questioner expand if there's anything else they wish to ask there. Um, and Peter, feel free to jump in at any time too for any of these, you know, and how does the automation cross match and merge and fat master records from multiple sources that represent the same real world uh, master entity? So that's a detailed question. Um, so how do we extract and match the same entity that describes the same thing from multiple systems that might might have different structures. This comes down to the definition of what the entity is in, in our view, right? Which is the definition of the entity, what is it as, a, as an entity outside of those systems? And then how does each system describe its part of that entity? It probably doesn't describe all of that entity, but it at least describes part of that entity. And it describes enough to be able to identify it. Then you can use data augmentation tools, like precisely, you can use matching tools within the MDM software. And we also use machine learning and, and AI to perform that matching, whether it's deterministic or, prob uh, or probability to, to say, to start to say, it is highly likely that these two records, both within a system or across systems are actually describing the same instance of the same thing. And then that forms that core of that entity going forward, right? And that's a standard matching technique that we that the the we use across that as well as data augmentation and reference data from third parties like DMB and others. Great. So Dave, as you were talking, you talked about connecting with other systems such as SAP and Salesforce. Do you connect directly with SAP MDG module? We we certainly have done. We've connected with most um SAP systems. SAP is pretty, I'm not going to say it's pretty open, but it, it's it's got some standard connection constructs. And MDG will do some of the master data. It usually does the bigger domains rather than all the domains. So MDG is one that we have connected to in the past, as well as SAP, uh, ERP, and 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 others. So so yes, we can use data from um, MDG. 
it, this did not use MDG necessarily, this particular implementation. Can I answer one of the questions on, uh, there's a question here, what it kind of impact will machine learning AI have on MDM and data governance? Um, that's actually a, a two-way street. So some of our, you know, here precisely, we're already working on doing some things with data go governance, especially data quality by using AI. But there's a flip side to that, which is what's the impact of MDM and data governance on machine learning and AI? Uh, and that goes back to one of the slides I presented. And, and just like the overall story that's being told in this, this presentation is uh, it's hard to get the full value out of AI unless you know what data you have to feed it and that you have some trust in that data. And the data is also in a format that helps make it make sense to the AI. Um, so there's, uh, I think it's it's both. Like it, it, machine learning AI is gonna have an effect on the way MDM and data governance is done, but MDM and data governance is gonna have a massive effect on giving you better results for machine learning and AI. So I'm, I, I'd like to build on what Peter just said. And actually, if you look at the Dataversity website uh, coming up, we're putting out a white paper on exactly this point, which is uh, how does data governance improve the models for AI so that your decision-making, your automated decisioning through AI and machine learning gets better, as well as how can you use machine learning and AI technologies within the scope of data governance to clean up some of that data as well. So we're, we're actually publishing a, a paper on that in the next uh, coming month. So look, look, look for that on Dataversity site. I love it. Uh, and we can try and get, if we get that, we'll get the link out to everybody. So um, have you uh, any other reference uh, on adaptive data model? Any other reference on the adaptive data model? So um, the adaptive data model is proprietary to workflow, uh, work, work day to a certain extent. So I can't naturally share that here, but if you wanna uh, reach out to me offline, we can talk more about it. It is a flexible data model. Um, and what we did was we logically uh, extracted the data from it. So so there's, there's constructs and Construct, uh, constructs within it that we uh, extracted and worked around within that, that structure, if that makes sense. It does. So um, what are the some of the horror stories that you've run to? I'm sure you both have lots of good horror stories. <laughs> um, how much time have we got? Uh, <laughs> <there's>... <laughs> 17 minutes. <laughs> okay. So there, there are, there's, there's a lot of stories and the industry abounds with, with stories in, uh, like I said, with shipping the wrong products to the wrong place with um, people budgeting in um, shipment ex ex export fines and various other things across the industry where it is data related and data consistency related. There's, uh, massive amounts of money saved by building up this consistency and showing how remedial action was being done and became endemic in people's processes to fix and remediate data and check, check, recheck, double check, triple check each time a piece of data or a, an item moves through a process, they would completely check and, and spend a, a tremendous amount of money. Uh, Peter, do you want to share any? Oh, it looks like we lost him. Oh. So uh -huh. this, this is a conversation <laughs> that, that, that we can absolutely continue uh, offline and we can, we can talk about it more and, we, and, we are going to be speaking at the uh, DGIQ conference in June. So if any of you are going to be there, then then look 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 for us, and we can share multiple stories from a number of our different clients. I don't naturally want to share them here because people might recognize them. 
<laughs> Fair enough. And uh, yeah, and both uh, D3 Clarity and Precisely will be at DGIQ. You can find them in the exhibit hall or just in some sessions as well as you'll be giving some presentations. So, you know, um, so what is the most crucial task to, that should be finished in master data management in your practice? And what's the most... Uh, there's a two-part question. First one is, you know, what is the most crucial task should be finished in MDM in your practice? And then the second is, what is the most essential function in MDM system? Data integration between OLTP systems? So, the most in the, from a, can you ask that question again? I missed the first, I, let me just start with the first one. Yeah, <laughs> and ask him separately. So what's the most crucial task which, that should be finished in a master data management in your practice? The task, the most crucial task, I think, is you're looking at a master data program is probably outside of the master, master data system and understanding the way the data describes the business and understanding the definitions of the entities that you're going, that you're defining as master data. Right, and getting a handle on that and the handle on the way your business interacts with them, right? To to start to, as you bring that together, you'll start to realize how that data truly describes the environment in which you operate. Now, as you place that into, master, uh, into a master data system, then the function of taking over or owning that or understanding where the system of record for that is, and placing it through a structured process is probably the number one function of the system. But the before you get into the function of the system, you really have to understand what it is you are trafficking and how you are trafficking it, right? How does a prospect turn into a customer? What is a customer? What are the ambiguities in the word customer as you use that across your business, right? Uh, how do you transact with that organization that is a customer? And I don't mind whether that's a customer or a, we were talking yesterday with an organization about incidents or a uh, vendor or a product or any one of these things that is somewhat tangible, right? Which is understand the core definition of what it is and then make sure you understand how that moves because every system that you have uses the same words to describe it. The word customer is used everywhere, but it doesn't always mean the same thing. And so you have to abstract that out of the different system definitions and start to say, this object manifests in this system like this. And so that, and then move that core structure, that core definition into your master data environment and then place that under management and then let the integration environment take care of getting it into those systems. So does that, that answers the first question. That, uh, I think Shannon, do you want to ask the second one again? So what is the most essential function in MDM system data integration between uh, OLTP systems? So I think the most crucial part in an MDM system is preserving that defined structure and definition right so it's an abstract idea not a firm idea but it's the 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 concept the master data system preserves and becomes the system of record for that definition and the way the data truly describes that thing and that definition needs to be in your business glossary written down down to the point of saying if you know these attributes make up one of these and these are unique because and then that master data system manages that definition and makes that core system of record that single point of truth if you like a point of definition for that entity that can then be integrated into a number number of other areas then your integration system can take care of the mapping the structure, the movement, and the trafficking, if you like, but the master data system preserves that strict definition of that strict system of record and that record of what that is and what that looks like as it moves into all those systems. Then your master data system 
gives you the ability to cross-reference across different amb ambiguous definitions of that thing, right? So you can now dereference between your ERP system, your uh, Salesforce automation system, your customer support system, your logistic system, et cetera. All these systems that use the same word, but a slightly different definition of it, can refer back to MDM and your reporting and business intelligence can refer back to MDM to give you that complete view and that structure. So MDM owns that definition, if you like, and that source of truth. Does that answer the question? I believe so. And Peter, welcome back. Um, I know we lost you there for a moment. I don't know if you have anything you wanna to add to that. The most no, just that I was happy to be able to get back into this. <laughs> <laughs> A bit discombobulated when it dropped me for no reason. <laughs> well, we you also missed the um question. We were kicking it to you if you had any horror stories. Um, you know, or maybe you know, what's the most challenging thing that your customers run into when trying to implement an MDM solution? Um I'm actually not going to answer that because it's too customer specific. <laughs> you know. But if we if I meet people <laughs> privately, I'll tell you. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I love it. Okay. So what are the benefits of establishing precise connections between data models and specific business functions or process? And I toss that to either of you. Yeah. So uh, precise is an interesting word there because things change and things move. The, the, um, the value is the streamlined and seamless movement of data that is now consistent across the organization, right? So the ability to, to, to move that, to preserve that mapping with a certain amount of flexibility from your, from your core system of record to the recipient systems uh, enables that to be seamless. Having said that, right, there's often flex movement and preserving a loose coupling without doing a strict hardwired coupling can be extremely valuable, particularly as you move into data warehouses and when you start looking at primary keys and foreign keys across systems. So there is some amount of flex that you want to put into that, but preserving the precision, especially the precision in the definitions and the definition of what is exactly managed here? What does this system need? What is the purpose of this system and how does it consume the data? Is extremely valuable in terms of fluidity and um, uh, speed, if you like, of moving the data across, uh, 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 across the systems and around the organization and responding, uh, allowing organ uh, applications to respond in the right time frame. Hope that helps. Uh, feel free to reach out to me in more detail if, if you need more clarity on some of these uh, answers or some of these questions. Indeed. So, and thank you. And when we've got about uh, seven minutes left, so we've got some time for more questions which are coming in. Uh, so, any key position uh, points when defining definition for attributes? So, Attributes are often defined for you, right? So the so yes, the the applications will have the attributes largely defined in them because you you have applications, you have this data. So often it's more of a, a establishing which attributes are important. So uh, look at the what we call the you know, as everybody refers to them, the critical data elements, the critical data attributes, if you like, for an entity. And what are those critical data elements actually doing? Are they defining the transaction or are they defining the identity of the entity? And what is the minimum set that allows you to truly identify that uh, ent a a entity? The way I describe define the minimum set is often looking at it and saying, if one of these attributes changes, do I truly have another entity, right? So if my name changes, am I truly, am I a different person? Am I, so that becomes 
So that becomes your definition of identity and a definition of uniqueness within this uh, entity. These attributes have different names in every system, different metadata describing them. So then it's that mapping to a central canonical definition for that entity. And then how do the attributes from the independent systems feed that? There is going to be a quality in them, right? I, whether it's called a name attribute or a long name or a first name or whatever, they, it exists as part of the identity of that entity because that entity exists in the real world. So the part and parcel of defining the entity is also getting into defining the attributes that define what how that entity is described, right? You've got the business definition that might describe in language, in written language, what an entity is and how it behaves. And then you've got the technical definition, which are the attributes that define that entity. And then you can expand from that core set of attributes into the attributes that you want to manage centrally versus the ones you want to manage an independent system versus the ones that get traffic between the systems, et cetera. But if you start with that, then you start looking at the attributes pretty early on as you define that entity, because you're not only defining the entity, you're looking at examples of where that entity exists in your business. And then you can pull out the attributes and start to say, okay, this is the minimum set that really decide defines the identity of this entity. Does that help? Indeed. And uh, how many, so I'm gonna see if I can slip in at least one more question here. So how many times have you found that all owners uh, so of major operational systems are politically in agreement to relinquish control over quote unquote their master data to a central MDM team and system? Almost never. <laughs> so I'm I'm being I'm I'm being a little flippant. Um so often there is a as a lot of you probably know, there's a tremendous amount of politics involved in in this. And you know we do get involved in that and help mediate some of that. Often, as we look at the definition of an entity, people start to realize that they have got their own definition. They have got a uniqueness construct or a uh, a definition that is fit for their function, but doesn't describe the whole entity across the organization. And so we've run into areas where you end up with multiple definitions and only that core set that actually, when you drill into it, they're not actually responsible for it most of the time, and they're prepared to relinquish that. A good example of that is we were working with a with a client um, where the finance organization was having issues, and the legal name of the customer came up. And while they didn't want to relinquish the ownership of the customer within the finance system, rightly so, they did want to relinquish the fact that they are not responsible for collecting the legal name of every customer. And that, that then moved that attribute ownership up to the sales team, where it's a 30 second conversation to ask what the legal name is during that sales process. And so as you drill down and boil out some of this ambiguity in these entity definitions, you start to see people relinquish some of the control not of the whole entity that they are but remember they usually own the purpose for which they are using the entity not necessarily the entity itself and when you separate the purpose and the data that is needed for that purpose from the core definition of that entity you often circumvent some of those some of that politics and some of that and you can have a more rational more objective conversation Perfect. And Peter, anything you want to add to that? Uh, just on uh, one other question in the last 60 seconds we have, which is what is the difficulty uh, for the data to accurately represent the information that is intended to describe? My, In my experience, data quality. No one is bothering to assess and correct the quality of their data. It's so important, especially trying to stand up all the AI initiatives. Yes. 
<laughs> yes. Well, Dave and Peter, thank you both so much for this great presentation, but I'm afraid that is all the time that we have for today. Uh, just a reminder to, and just, and thank you to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. Uh, just again, a reminder, I'll send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday to all registrants with links to the slides and links to the recording. Thank you both so much. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thanks, y'all. I hope y'all have a great day.